gummy worm? Yeah. All right. Well, we'll get started a little early here, guys. By way of introduction, my name's Dylan uh, from Hubbard's Marina. We are over in John's Pass, Madeira Beach. We do a lot of different sorts of fishing over there at Hubbard's Marina. Uh, we specialize in near shore and offshore fishing. And uh, we have two big party boats uh, and a variety of different charter boats. And we specialize in kind of that large group private charter fishing and then also the party boat fishing. And uh, we do 5, 10, 12, 39, and 44 hour party boat trips and a variety of other different uh, adventures too. Uh, but today we're here to talk a little bit about fishing, right? All right, hopefully you guys wake up a little bit through the seminar. This is a fishing conversation. I don't want to stand up here and talk at you. I want to talk with you. So hopefully we'll be able to have a little bit of a conversation going on. But uh, I like to kind of kick these things off by talking a little bit about what's going on now and what's kind of coming up. And then from there, hopefully you guys have some questions and we'll be able to kind of tailor this to what you all want to hear instead of just me up here talking. All right. So right now, uh, in the late April, early May time frame, uh, based on weather, we're in the thick of our mackerel and kingfish run. We got a lot of mackerel on the beaches all the way out to about 80, 90, 100 foot of water. We see a lot of kingfish mixed in uh, on those near shore trips and near shore waters. And then as you get deeper, it transitions to more kingfish than mackerel. Once you get past 80, 100 foot of water, you really stop seeing the mackerel and it's mostly kingfish. Also, once you get past about 80, 100 foot of water, we see more of those red grouper. And then you have a shot at those, uh, excuse me, once past 80 to 100 foot, uh, you see also those blackfin tuna is what I was talking about. We're talking pelagic fish. So uh, you got the mackerel till 80, 100 foot, then the kingfish continue, and then you start to see those blackfin tuna around that depth range. And then also wahoo. This time of year, we see a lot of those wahoo. We've caught a few of them in the past two weeks and uh, definitely got a great chance on those species as we move into that later May, into the summertime. Those wahoo are definitely going to be around still too. So great time to get out there and catch them and uh, take advantage of that opportunity with the pelagics which should continue pretty much through summertime in the deeper water. Near shore, those kingfish and mackerel will start to kind of dwindle off as that water temperature uh, rises too high outside of their range from like 73, 72, 73, up to about 78 degree water temperatures. That's where those kingfish and mackerel like it. Anything above like that upper 70s, we start to lose them and uh, then they disappear until the fall when the water starts cooling back down a little bit. But offshore and deeper water beyond 100, 120 foot of water, you get those different uh, temperature gradients, temperature currents that'll keep those pelagic fish going uh, offshore through the summertime. And uh, dolphins, mahi-mahi also show up as that water warms up too. So that's what we got going on pelagic wise through our spring and summer. And then as far as reef fish goes, those bottom fish, grouper and snapper, we're seeing quite a few of those red grouper right now. The red grouper bites definitely picked up quite a bit. Anywhere from about 80 to about 120 foot of water, we're doing real well on our kind of deeper water near shore, 10 hour trips, private fishing charters uh, on the hub, the Flying Hub 2. And we're also starting to see a lot of those mangrove snapper. The mangrove snapper bites definitely picked up considerably. Our 10 hours are fishing a little deeper right now to capitalize on that good red grouper bite, the improved mangrove snapper bite. We're seeing a lot of lane snapper too. This morning's 39 hour came back with probably one of the biggest lane snapper I've ever seen. It was like 22-ish inches. It was, it was massive. Uh, so we're seeing some nice size fish uh, between the lane snapper, mangroves, uh, vermilions, porgies, uh, some nice red grouper, and uh, the occasional hogfish. The hogfish bite overall has kind of slowed down a little bit as that water temperature starts to warm up a little bit. Uh, and we, that's part another reason why those 10 hour trips are fishing a little deeper right now. We're giving those hogfish a break moving out a little deeper to take advantage of that better improved mangrove snapper and red grouper bite that we're seeing. Offshore and deep water, 
This time of year in April, we're on the backside of that deep water closure that occurs every February and March. So we're really starting to focus in more on that deeper water when weather allows. Unfortunately, this year, 2022, it's been incredibly windy and uh, it's really made it difficult through the month of April to get out there to that deep water uh, where we like to target and kind of live this time of year. Uh, normally through the month of April, we run a lot of those 12 hour stream trips, 39 hours, 44 hours, where we're fishing 160 to 200 foot of water, targeting those fat red groupers, scamp grouper, bigger mangroves. And we just really haven't had that flexibility with the way the wind's been blowing. Even that 39 hour that came in this morning, they were fishing shallower because the weather forecast was calling six foot seas, 20 to 25 knot winds. It never really got that terrible. Uh, it was a, the weather was a, a little bit nicer than they forecasted. Not a lot, but uh, it was a little bit nicer than they forecasted. But we stayed in 100 to uh, 110 to about 140 foot of water and uh, ended up doing really nice uh, on those mangrove snapper. And then the red grouper was a little picky for us this weekend, but we were able to kind of stick and move and put together a nice catch of those red grouper too. And the yellowtail bite out in deeper water has really, really picked up too. So lots of good fish to catch, just really focus on those weather windows and trying to capitalize on how, uh, how you can capitalize on those good weather windows to catch as many fish as you can. And uh, looks like this week we're going to get that nice little weather break towards the second half of the week, so we're excited about that. Does anybody want to kick it off with a question? What do you guys want to chat about? How big are blackfin tuna? Uh, we catch some pretty good sized blackfin tuna. We don't get the yellowfin tuna, the bluefin tuna in our area. They are off our coast. They just stay really far off our coast. Uh, because they travel into the Gulf of Mexico and especially into the northern Gulf in the cooler months to spawn. Uh, so like around Louisiana, that area, around the Mississippi, they get a lot of those different tuna species. Here in our kind of range from 100 miles to the beaches, the one tuna that we see uh, is blackfin tuna. Occasionally we catch a yellowfin, but it's rare. Uh, we. I don't recall ever catching a black or a bluefin tuna in that range, but we get a lot of the blackfin and the, the typical schooly size blackfin tuna that we catch uh, in our areas, anywhere from here to a pretty good size, like 28 pounds. Sometimes they'll push 29, 30, uh, but we don't see the over 30 pounders and we don't see the little footballs that they get in the Keys. Uh, you go down to the Keys and they get them like this big sometimes, like little cute cute ones you know uh, we don't really see that uh, in our area we have a typically a pretty good average size blackfin tuna a big one is pushing 30 pounds kind of an average one's closer to like 15 to 20 but they're meaty fish and they're very good eating uh, targeting a blackfin tuna um, most of the time we encounter blackfin tuna while trolling uh, so on for example on our trips we're going bottom fishing, so we are focused on going bottom fishing. So the boat doesn't slow down for people to reel in those trolling fish because everybody else on the boat wants to tr uh, bottom fish and they don't really care about the trolling. But on our five hour half days, you can troll on the way out, way back if you got a big enough reel. On our 39 and 44 hour trips, you can troll uh, in between spots on the way out if you got a big enough reel, but you need like a a 50 wide or 80 wide, a, a very significant reel, typically two speed is best, uh, and a lot of drag. And I would not troll for blackfin tuna until you were out past about 80, 90 foot of water. Uh, we see them most often, in my opinion, during the cooler months, but they're really here all year round. And a lot of people encounter them in the summertime, but that's a lot of times because we're out fishing deeper because of red snapper season. Uh, but if you ask 10 different people, they'd tell you 10 different things about the best time to catch them. I know personally the best trip that I was on that I remember catching them was a February new moon. We caught like 30 some off blackfin tuna. Uh, but we see them in the spring, we see them in the fall, we see them through summertime too. Uh, but again, to answer your question, I would typically be trolling for them. Uh, the, the cedar plug is a type of trolling lure. It's like a... Uh, it's, 
they call it a plug, but it's more of like almost a bamboo stick with a lead head, uh, but it's cedar wood uh, with a lead head. And that's like the tuna jig. Uh, so you control those. Me personally, I wouldn't. Uh, the, the lure that's been most successful, in my opinion, for trolling for black fin tuna has been the Rapala X-Rap 30 Magnum or the 40 Magnum or the Nomad DTX uh, uh, lipped plug. Um, so I would troll one of those once you are out there past 80 foot of water. But you can also get them uh, flatlining too. We get a lot of tuna flatlining. Uh, a lot of times you'll see them. Uh, break in the surface you can get a flat line out there to them and sometimes you'll even have big schools come up on us uh, I remember one trip we were on the flying up to like Upper end of 200 foot of water and uh, we we're out there catching uh, red grouper scamp grouper and all of a sudden just like this school of fish starts coming our way It was all tuna. Uh, we just absolutely crushed them and uh, they like that that monofilament or fluorocarbon leader they don't like wire, so if you're going to set out a flat line to target the tuna, you know tuna's around, I would avoid using wire. This time of year, though, I would encourage you to set out a flat line with wire on it. A tuna, a blackfin tuna will bite a wire kingfish rig, what we call a stinger rig, but they definitely uh, are, are smart fish. They got a big eyeball. They have good eyesight, so avoiding wire is best. Like typically a, a 40, 50 pound fluorocarbon, uh, maybe six foot leader and a five out circle hook with a tail hook pin fish or a uh, dead thread fin is what I would throw out on a flat line for those black fin tuna. But you can also get them uh, uh, vertical jigging. But I would say 90% of the tuna we catch are either uh, trolling, flat lining, and then sometimes you get them dropping a pin fish to bottom while you're grouper fishing or reeling it up. So you never know. And even catch them on the bottom. We've had them where clients have caught them on the bottom. Well, they're, they're, they probably weren't holding bottom. They probably dropped the pinfish down and cranked it up once or twice. Uh, but yeah, you do occasionally catch them bottom fishing too. Now guys, we had a few more people walk up. We're gonna do one last call for those raffle tickets. If you haven't collected a raffle ticket yet for those free trips, come on up. Then we're not doing it again. So keep it fair. That way those of you who showed up early can get a chance to catch them. All right, and is she here? Yes. Oh, I saw you with her. You with somebody up oh, three? All right. How many do you need? You are all right. I don't care what I'm <laughs> Ma'am, how many do you need? Just one? Uh, 49. All right, guys, so uh, everybody got a raffle ticket. All right, cool. So we finished up talking about those uh, blackfin tuna, I think, that answer your question. Perfect, anything else? Wahoo. Wahoo. Uh, trolling, trolling would be the best bet for Wahoo. Um, I would say most of the Wahoo that we catch come up on the Nomad DTX uh, minnow or the, um, I think they call it a I think they call it a mad scad or no it's like it's very similar to the yozuri bonita the really large uh version of the mad scad from nomad it's a very large trolling lure and wahoo are very prolific much more so than uh people realize uh in my opinion and a lot of people will catch them trolling even at pretty high rates of speed because a wahoo is one of the it is i think the fastest fish in the sea uh, and you can catch them trolling at 16, 18 knots. So like 18, 20, 22 miles an hour. Uh, so a lot of boats, especially slower boats that aren't planed off, you could troll almost all the time for Wahoo. And uh, there's boats that do, and they do so very successfully. Like I, I have a buddy whose charter boat only runs about 16, 18 knots. And once he gets past 60, 70 foot of water, he puts out a Wahoo troller and he catches Wahoo almost year round, uh, even in shallow water, 80, 100 foot of water. So there's definitely a lot of Wahoo out there, but it takes a really, really large trolling lure like those Nomad DTXs or that Nomad Mad Scad, like the Yozuri Bonita style jig. 
uh, or occasionally we'll get them on a flat line, but it's rare. Most of the time, if you hook them on a flat line, you're screwed, unless you have the right kind of uh, reel. Like if, if, I, if I was flat lining with this spinning rod and I hooked a nice wahoo, there's no shot. Even with 50 pounds of drag, I'm not gonna stop that fish. He's gonna break me off or spool me before I have a chance to catch him. Unless you were to pull up anchor and try to chase him. Uh, you need definitely wire helps, uh, but this is what you really want to be tr uh, flatlining for, especially if there's a chance for a wahoo. And when I'm out in deeper water past 100, 120 foot, I'm going to try to flatline all the time with one of these uh, because you have more line capacity. And if you hook a big 50, 60 pound kingfish or a uh, 40, 50 pound wahoo, you actually got a shot because you have the line capacity due to the larger reel. So definitely helps thinking that way. Uh, for wire or for trolling for kingfish, a lot of people use uh, tri or three strand wire, uh, but most of the time when you're flatlining, it's just single strand wire. But similar to a kingfish, you do a kingfish rig, kingfish stinger rig, that style uh, setup for trolling for those wahoo, for or uh, flatlining for those wahoo. Yeah, so uh, as of, I think it was January 13 of this year, uh, they made it mandatory uh, through the Descend Act uh, that you had to carry with you at all times a uh, venting tool or a uh, descending device, and they had to be rigged and ready. So for venting tools, a lot of times we will have just an old school modified stringer, uh, but you can buy a nice venting tool and for me, the modified stringer is what I'm going to use to vent a fish. But according to the definition of the law, what actually works really well and what we've designed to work really well is not included in the law. So we have a venting tool on deck just to, to make sure we appease any boarding officers who wants to read the letter of the law. But a descending device is really the best option. Someone just broke something. A descending device is definitely the best option uh, if you're not super experienced on where to vent that fish. Uh, but barotrauma is a big, big thing. And I don't want to go too far down the road, but I just want to make sure we put it out there. It really is kind of unique to me and, and frustrating to me how when you're inshore fishing, you see those people like wet their hands down and cradle that trout and really take care of their snook and make sure they're cradling their belly and they don't hold them vertically. They do all those things to take care of those inshore game fish. And that same angler will go offshore and let a red snapper that's out of season flop and hit the metal deck and flop around as they dig through their mouth with a pair of uh, needle nose and then throw them back in and let them float away. It's very frustrating to me. If you take the time to make sure you're not hanging your snook vertically, you're not breaking their jaw by hanging them by uh, their jaw, you're taking care of your trout, wetting your hands first, making sure they're not out of the water too much, you should take that same energy and care and approach offshore. And if you're not keeping the fish, it shouldn't be on your boat. It should be hanging over the water and using a tool like one of these, uh, one of these de-hooking devices, I mean, literally, a fish that I catch that I don't want to keep. Even when I'm using my, uh, look at this, great example. I'm trying to say how these things get snagged everywhere, and it had snagged the tablecloth just sitting there. But even one of these uh, uh, vertical jigs, I'll show you. These things have four hooks on them. So when you're out there vertical jigging, uh, you a lot of times will have all four hooks in a fish. Let me grab a, another jig to use as an example. And I'm just going to hook that jig on one of the hooks here. So this jig dangling is my fish. And you take one of these de-hooking tools. Thank you. You take one of these de-hooking tools, and if this fish is out of season, he doesn't even come on the boat. 
I just grab the back of the hook that he's hanging from with the end of the de-hooking de device, pull the trigger, and it turns the hook upside down. Literally two hooks were in that fish, and with the pull, with the pull of the tool, it turns the hook upside down, and the weight of the fish pulls itself off the hook. So that way I have more fishing time and I'm going to be more successful while I'm out there fishing and I'm taking better care of the fish. It helps you catch more fish. It saves you more time to have your bait on the bottom more to get more chances at hooking up and getting bites and it's better for the fish. So really, really encourage everybody to throw away your needle nose pliers and get you a good pair of de-hooking devices, whether that's the little loop one, whatever you want to use. Me personally, I really like these. And uh, we worked with uh, Barracuda Tackle to develop those. I believe they might have uh, versions of them here, but the ones we carry in our shop are the stainless steel made in the United States and they turn the hook upside down. Because this tool is made by Baker, Rapala has a version of it. I believe even Bass Pro has their own version of it. But what makes this tool unique is the tip and the offset bevels and that was patented and trademarked by a uh, company that went out of business and then all of a sudden you couldn't get the, the really good tool and uh, I worked with another tackle shop and actually or another tackle uh, manufacturer and got the trademark uh, removed so now uh, they're able to mass produce them once again so when you get one of these you want to make sure it's the type that turns the hook upside down because a lot of times when you grab the back of the hook and you pull the trigger, a lot of these brands will only turn the hook like that. And it doesn't really do much good because then you have to kind of hold it awkwardly and make it fall off. You want the ones that turn the hook upside down. So that way the fish just falls right off the hook. It makes it real, real easy. But get yourself a good pair of hookers. And to answer your question, yes, you have to have either a descending tool or a venting tool uh, rigged and ready when offshore fishing in federal waters for reef fish. So if you've got red snapper, or any sort of snapper or grouper in your fish box and you get stopped offshore, you have to be able to show that you have a descending device or a venting tool rigged and ready. What that means definition wise is going to be kind of officer discretion. So I would have one close by. <laughs> any other questions? What? Snappers? Red snappers? You don't need a seminar for that, dude. They bite, they bite anything. Uh, red snapper, I mean, I, I get a little frustrated with red snapper just because they're only open for a short time each year. In my opinion, they don't taste that much better than a mangrove snapper or, or the other snapper that we catch year round. Like for example, the, what we call a gray snapper, the white grunt. I think is a, an amazing eating fish and we can catch them really easily 20, 30, 40 foot of water. A mangrove snapper, I think is my favorite eating snapper. Lane snapper, another great eating snapper. Yellowtail snapper, way better than a red snapper. But people get red snapper so mixed up and they get put on such a high pedestal, it kind of frustrates me a little bit. Plus they're only open for a short time. So what'll happen is the guys like when I was growing up, when red snapper season, or when red snapper weren't even a thing, I remember catching my first one. I was like, what's this? And no one really knew what they were because we didn't get a lot of them back then uh, because they had been fished down so hard. And now they've come back and they're super prolific and everybody wants to catch a red snapper because it's always in the news. It's always being fought over. There's a lot of contention over red snapper. So it's like a household name. You get someone from like Wisconsin who comes down what trips do you have for red snapper? Well, that's only open 60 days out of the year, bud. You're not going to get a chance on this visit in December, you know? So a lot of people get this notion in their head. And then what happens is we'll run 39 hour trips, for example, 70, 80% of the year, they're only 50, 60, 70% full. During red snapper season, they're sold out 100% full six, eight months in advance. And people will only fish during red snapper season. You'll see a guy every week for five, six weeks during red snapper season. Then you won't see him the rest of the year. And then he's complaining that trips are full. It's like, bro, go any other time of the year and trips are half full or even less than that. And there's plenty of room around the boat and it's a good time and you catch plenty of fish. 
you just don't get that red snapper. So excuse my frustration with red snapper, but to answer your question on how to target them, anything, anything. They're really stupid, really easy to catch, and they suck. <laughs> no, I mean, red snapper are super aggressive. If there's red snapper there, uh, they're gonna bite whatever you throw at them, whether it's a metal jig, a live pinfish, a cigar minnow, a thread fin, a dead, dead bait, a bonita, mullet, ladyfish. Everybody has their favorite red snapper bait that they swear by, but I, they will literally bite anything and everything you throw at them. I've, you, you've probably seen the viral YouTube video of the guy using a chunk of banana to catch one. Uh, so once you get the red snapper chummed up, they're excited, they will bite anything you throw at them. They're like the Jack Cravel of offshore. Uh, the shallowest you can get red snapper, they've, they've been proliferating and they're definitely expanding. Um, we see them as shallow as 30, 40, 50, 60 foot of water occasionally. The shallowest to go out there and like target a keeper fish, the, the shallowest I would run a charter, take money and feel confident or be able to sleep at night and offer a trip, I would say about 120. But you can get them in 80, 90, 100 foot of water sometimes, uh, but really about 120, 130, 140 is where you start to see them and really start to see them more consistently. To get a big red snapper, you want to be out in 150, 180 foot of water. And to get really monster red snapper, especially as season opens up and a billion boats are out there, because not only are on our boats, but everybody in the whole dang Florida Peninsula that has a boat seems to only want to use it in June and July when red snapper season's open. So they get a ton of pressure. So like that 120 foot of water stuff is okay, but once season opens for recreational and federal for hire, there's a billion boats out there in 120 foot. We just keep going until we're 200, 250. And then by the end of red snapper season, we're approaching 300 foot of water to, to follow those fish and to stay away from the crowd and to stay on the, the bigger average size of fish. But you can catch them in the shallow, like I said, about 80 to 120 foot of water. But I've had a buddy catch a keeper in Tampa Bay and uh, we've caught large fish on our, on our five and 10 hour trips. But if you wanna go out there and target a red snapper, the only trips we offer that have options to keep red snapper, or that have, that advertise that you can catch and keep red snapper would be a 12 hour extreme 39 hour or 44 hour or one of those long range private charters on the flying hub too uh, because the hub can't really get out super far because of its uh, speed a 10 hour trip doesn't fish far enough you got no shot on a half day a 12 hour night trip sometimes we see them uh, but you're really kind of on that border fishing at 120 130 foot of water on those 12 hour night trips plus they typically bite better during the day so we target them during the day primarily, and that's when we catch a majority of our red snapper. You can't catch them at night, and they do sometimes bite at night, but a lot of times on like the 39 hour and 44 hours during red snapper season, we start off in the night focused a little shallower, trying to catch our mangrove snappers, vermilions, porgies. Then during the day, we try to uh, transition to those red snapper. Then we go into gag grouper uh, because they'll be open in June too. One thing that we do on Red Snapper that I wish everybody out there did is we go out and we get our boat limit or we try to get our boat limit and we move on. So what some people will do is you're allowed two Red Snapper per day. On a 39 hour trip or 44 hour trip, you have a two day bag limit. So you're allowed four Red Snapper. So what some people will do is they'll catch their three Red Snapper and then all of a sudden you'll see them reel up a red snapper and they go to throw it back. It's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. You can still keep a fourth. Oh, I'm saving that for the big one, Cap. Dude, now you're just releasing fish and every time you release a fish, there's a pretty good percentage chance that it's not gonna survive because of those barotrauma issues. So I would encourage you just to keep the fish you catch, fill your bag limit, and then from there, pass them out like, uh, Susie down the way has only got three. She needs one more. I right, pass her that fish. She's limited out. And then once we do that, and the boat's caught a chance or had a chance to limit out, then we move off them. And then the rest of the trip, we try to avoid them 
and try to target those red grouper, guy grouper, scamp grouper. So a lot of times when we have a really good catch of red snapper, someone will come off the boat up, oh, we got two red snapper. How many did you throw back? Well, 10. Because <laughs> they wanted to catch that, that 20 pounder, you know? So definitely try to just keep your fish that you catch and then transition and target those mangroves, target those grouper, target something else while you're out there. Highly encourage that. And I wish, I wish everybody did that because that's one of the big issues that we're going to see over the course of the next few years is the discards issues. Uh, so definitely one of the Like, are you saying during during red snapper season? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I if... Try to paper bag with a little rubber band and then jerk it a couple times, but yeah. it, it, I mean, it the, seemed to follow it down. Yeah, the biggest thing I would say to get past the red snapper um, when, when you've caught your limit and we're still fishing for them is to uh, try different baits. Try different baits that are going to get past them, like a, a bigger bait a lot of times. So, like, out there... Uh, on a 39 hour trip during red snapper season if I've caught my limit already I fish for red snapper primarily with thread fins or small to medium live pin fish Then once I catch my limit then I switch to a bigger bait a big chunk of Vanita or a, a, a big live bait and I'm targeting those gag grouper and Even a really big red snapper is not gonna take a, a really big live bait So you kind of sort through them like that by using a bigger bait trying to change that selectivity, or I switch to a smaller piece of bait and try to rocket it down there as fast as I can. And then sometimes you'll get lucky and get past them. Um, like a small chunk of squid for yellowtail, or a small chunk of thread fin for mangrove snapper, and try to just get past them that way with a little heavier weight than you would normally use. Uh, or some of the, the slow pitch jigs, but red snapper love those too. So. It's a, it's a little challenging, like outside of red snapper season, if you're not targeting red snapper, you shouldn't be fishing there. You should move depths, move areas, try to find a different area. Red snapper are definitely very aggressive, and when they're in an area, they're in an area. But a lot of times, like that area you were talking about, that's a red snapper area. You get out of that area a little ways, you can start finding some areas that don't have as much biomass as a red snapper. Because it's tough. When there's a cloud of red snapper over that ledge, even if there's a black there, you're never going to catch him. Because you got to catch 400 red snapper before you got a shot at catching him, you know? So I, it's tough, and I would just say try to move out of that area, try to explore different areas, and then hold that in your back pocket for red snapper season. And that's kind of what we do is if I know this, this little area off this rock at this depth is going to be primarily red snapper, that stays true for a pretty good amount of time. But what we do is we go back there, and we know there's gags there, and that's a ga good gag grouper fishing area. That's one of the first stops we make in red snapper season to kill off those red snapper that are blocking us from getting to our gags. And then we can come back there in October, November, and December when the gags are biting better and uh, we've cleaned out our red snapper problem. So that's something you can think about as well is you know there's some really good grouper on this spot. Save that spot if you can until red snapper season to where you can take people out there a couple days in a row and clean out some of those fish throw them in the fish box. Any other questions? Mangrove snapper. Mangrove snapper. So that's my favorite fish to target. I, I love catching mangrove snapper. One of my favorite eating fish. Uh, and they are super smart, uh, very kind of leader shy, and uh, they can be a little picky. So they're a lot of fun to target. And I strongly believe, and I always say this in a lot of seminars, is the person who can catch mangrove snapper consistently and catch them often uh, in a variety of depths and trips is definitely the most experienced angler. They kind of separate the experienced angler from the non-experienced angler. A lot of times I'll get a guy or a gal who wants to start fishing with us and they start doing a couple trips. They might even buy a rod and a reel. Then they start doing more trips and they're really getting dialed in. About a year, year and a half into it, I'll always, they'll come up 
man, how do I catch those mangrove snapper? And then all of a sudden, a few months later, once they kind of get some tips and tricks and they're starting to ask, they, they get dialed in on the mangroves. And then all of a sudden they got the high end gear and they've got it figured out. Uh, and it's really interesting to, see, to me to kind of see that evolution of someone who's never fished off shore before to then all of a sudden I'm doing long range trips to all of a sudden I've bought my own tackle to all of a sudden I've got it figured out. It's pretty cool to watch. But mangrove snapper, definitely are smart fish. So you really got to think about everything when you're going after those mangrove snapper. The, the, the main things that a lot of people mess up that they don't really necessarily think about too much is the finer details of making sure that you're hooking your bait straight so it doesn't uh, spin on the way to bottom, making sure that you're holding bottom and actively fishing to make sure that lead's not disturbing the bottom, and then you're keeping that connection with the bait. That way, if a fish comes up and does nibble at it, you're able to set the hook. Because a mangrove snapper is not only smart and leader shy, but when they bite, they bite quick. And if you're not finger on the trigger ready to pull it, you're gonna miss that bite. So you gotta make sure you hook your bait properly, display that bait properly, and then you're ready to pull the trigger really quickly uh, by setting the hook quickly. So a lot of times we'll be using more of these uh, uh, high speed gear ratio reels. And I like the new uh, two speed reels because it makes it real, real easy to target those fish a little bit more successfully because occasionally you do hook up on a bigger fish. So having a two speed enables me to click a button and all of a sudden I've got a bigger reel in my hand. So the two speeds help for that reason. A double snell rig is super helpful. These are super small hooks. Uh, I forget what I was doing with this, but uh, it's still a double snell rig. And the double snell is definitely your best bet when you're targeting those mangroves, hiding those uh, hooks. Actually, I do recall now, it was, a, it was a little bit tougher bite, so we're using a little smaller hooks to try to hide that, that hook from the fish. But a double snell rig definitely helps. That way you increase your chances of hooking up with those uh, mangrove snapper because you're using a chunk of thread fin. You're cutting the head, you're cutting the tail. A lot of times I'll even trim the belly to get me a nice little stick of uh, oily thread fin and I'll stick uh, a hook on either end kind of in the middle of that bait. So uh, you'll notice here these are smaller hooks but they're pretty far spaced apart. If these were, were larger hooks, they would be almost butted up against each other because all, the only thing the spacing's there for is for the size bait. So if you're using a chunk of bait this size, that would be good size spacing on the hooks. If I was using a chunk of bait this big, those hooks would have to be a lot further apart. So your, your hook spacing is all about your size of bait. And then besides that, you wanna make sure that you have nice uh, thin wire hooks. A lot of people will go out there after those mangroves and they're using four X strong hooks, super thick wire hooks. That doesn't work. A mangrove snapper bites quickly. You want to make sure you can hook that fish. So thinner wire hooks really, really help. So lighter hooks, smaller barbs too. A lot of times you'll get these hooks with like these crazy barbs, especially live bait hooks. They have a bigger barb to keep the live bait on there. They suck when trying to target those mangroves. You need a thin wire hook, a very small barb makes it more of like a needle, you're more likely to get that fish hooked. Then as long as you keep steady pressure on him, he can't spit the hook. So thin wire, uh, very small bar, good spacing on your double snell to uh, uh, make sure you can hide those hooks effectively. A decent size, four or five foot leader. And then imperative, you got that slip lead going on. The slip lead means your egg sinker is put on your uh, main line, you've got your swivel, and then you've got your leader. The reason you need that slip lead is because of that sensitivity and ability to feel the bite. Because when you've got that slip lead going, I've got my line just tight enough to feel it on my uh, rod tip there. If I pull it any harder, the rod's gonna fall off the table, right? It's just leaning against the table. So I just barely got enough tension to feel the lead, but not disturb the lead off the bottom. And you can see here with my other hand, I'm just gonna barely barely touch that hook and look how much that rod tip's moving because with the slip lead my hook is connected to my rod tip 
It's not connected to a lead. If you've got one of those leads with a swivel on either end, what's connected to your rod tip? The lead, the lead, that six ounce lead. So you've got to have a fish bite six ounce, move, bite hard enough to move six ounces of lead before that rod tip's ever going to move. So a slip lead is so important to make sure you have that direct connection with your rod tip. People spend $300, $400 on a custom rod and then put a swivel on it with a sw uh, or a lead on it with a swivel on either end. It's like, come on, come on, man. There's no reason for a nice rod because you cut out all your sensitivity. So make sure you have a slip lead, double Snell rig. Then you want to make sure you hook your bait straight. And what that means is think about it in the sense of hydrodynamics and when you're dropping your bait to bottom, what's dragging your bait to bottom? The lead. So how this falls to bottom is your lead is dropping to bottom and your bait is coming up above your lead. So a lot of times as your bait drops to bottom, your line is parallel with your main line. So if you don't hook your bait properly and it's kind of off kilter or looks a little diagonal, it's gonna come up against your main line and it's gonna twist and it's gonna fall down in a big tangled mess. And you're never gonna have a shot to catch that fish. So you gotta hook your bait straight to make sure that once it gets up against your main line, it's not gonna get tangled with your main line. Then also, you wanna make sure that you are, once you get to bottom, that you're setting that bait out and, and stretching it out and fishing naturally. Because a lot of times, what'll happen is, here, I'll do it on this uh, glass counter over here. A lot of times when your bait drops to the bottom, your, your swivel and, or your hooks and your uh, lead are going to be dropping to the bottom almost right on top of each other. Because remember, as that bait goes to the bottom, it's coming up and your line is parallel with your main line. So when it hits bottom, a lot of times your lead's going to hit bottom and the bait's going to flutter down right next to the lead. So what you want to do, and what I typically do, is once we start fishing and I drop down to bottom, I'll wait a minute, a minute or two. If I don't get a nibble right away, what I'll do is I'll lift my rod tip up to the sky real slowly, and I'll drop it back down the bottom. And what happens is, you get back over here. So what happens is when you, when you drop down, I'll wait a minute or two. If I don't feel that bite, I'll lift my rod tip up to the sky real slowly, enough so where I can feel the lead pick up off the bottom, and then I feel the bait pick up off the bottom. And then once I got it up, I'll drop it back down real slowly. And the idea behind that is not to get it up off the bottom or anything else. All it's, all it's doing is giving the time, because a lot of times, thin wire hooks with no barb, you can even snag your shorts. Uh, but a lot of times when you lift your rod tip up, what's happening is as that lead picks up off the bottom, your bait picks up off the bottom, and you drop it back down to bottom real slowly, the current that's down there on the bottom or the swing of the boat or the drift of the boat is going to straighten out your leader for you. So now instead of it being in a tangled mess right on top of each other or not even tangled, maybe it's just kind of laying on top of the weight, now it's nice and stretched out. So that really helps a more natural presentation. You got to think like a fish. It, you go to a restaurant and they slap a bunch of stuff on a plate not that appetizing. You go to that five-star restaurant that you spent $40 on your plate, they've got little garnishes on it. It's all, it's all plated nicely. It looks good. And that's the, the presentation. It's the same thing when you're bottom fishing. If you just let it fall to bottom and don't think about it, you're, you're, at, the dine, you're at the Waffle House where you're questioning your food. Whereas if you slowly lift up your rod tip, you're hooking your bait properly, you're letting it fall back down, now you're at that five-star steakhouse. It's, it's appetizing, it looks natural. You're more likely to get bit, especially on those smarter fish, mutton, uh, gag grouper, big mangroves. They are smarter fish and they've been around the block. And a lot of times even bigger fish, like when the bite's good, you can catch mangroves, even gags, uh, but when those smarter fish are there, that big trophy gag, that eight, nine pound mangrove, those fish have been around the block once or twice. They might even have been hooked once or twice. 
They're not going to be fooled unless you're doing everything right. So that's going to give you more chances at hooking up. Now, once you've got it, that all done, you've hooked your bait right, you've got the knocker rig, you've got the slip lead, you drop down, you straightened out your leader. Now you're ready for the next part. This, this technique that we're going to talk about now, once you've mastered this, this transfers to all other sorts and types of fishing. And it really, really helps you catch more fish offshore. I'm going to need a volunteer. You got me? Oh, you got your hands full, my man. How about you? <laughs> Just put your hand out like this for me. Yep, perfect. And you're gonna just hold that lead with your uh, palm totally flat. So if I was to move the lead, it's gonna fall out of your hand. So make that palm nice and flat, like you're the bottom. All right, now just slowly move your hand up and down like you're on a boat. So you should be able to keep that rod tip moving and actively fishing to where if you're not gonna disturb the lead on the bottom. So as the boat's bouncing, even if you're in a little bit of a sea, not much of a sea at all, even a foot, even if it's flat calm, the boat's moving. And if you're not actively fishing, what's happening? I'm gonna hold my rod tip steady and that boat's gonna keep moving and my lead's gonna bounce on the bottom. So every time your lead is disturbed on the bottom, it creates a little puff of sand because we're fishing hard rock bottom and hard bottom gets a layer of silt. And every time that lead even rolls, it creates a puff of sand. And anything smart, anything quality that was looking at your bait is gone. The dumb ones, the aggressive ones, they're gonna keep looking and if they're hungry enough, they'll still eat it. But think about this, sound travels two or three times, I think, I think it's three times faster underwater, I forget. But sound travels faster underwater. So you hear this little six ounce lead bouncing off the bottom right here. I'm only moving it about a foot or two feet off the ground. A lot of times we're in a three foot sea. So you're in a three or four foot sea, that lead's loud, right? Imagine that underwater. Sounds traveling even faster, even further. If you're not actively fishing, dancing with the boat, moving that rod tip with the boat, keeping that line tight enough to feel the lead but not disturb it. As you saw, he's moving his hand up and down and I'm moving my rod tip, keeping that line tight enough to feel the lead but not disturb it. That is gonna make all the difference in the world. That's, that's the difference between not limiting out on mangroves and having a chance to limit out on mangroves, actively fishing. Because mangrove snapper are smart. They're gonna bite and you're not gonna feel it if you don't have that line tight enough to feel the lead and tight enough to feel the bite. Real, real important. All right. So his question is about braided line and would it help? In my opinion, mono is great, especially with some of the new technology we out, I have out with some of these nicer rods. Monofilament is really the way to go. And I'm not saying that because we operate party boats and mono is uh, better. Uh, I'm just saying that in general, you really only need mono, especially if you have some of that nicer tackle. Braided line helps in certain applications. If you're fishing 250, 300 foot, 400 foot of water all the time, braided line helps because it increases that sensitivity. But 95% of fishermen are fishing 200 foot of water or less 95% of the time, you know? So if you're fishing 200 foot or water or less, mono is great. And the improvements in mono really are, have been ph uh, phenomenal. So monofilament works to give you plenty of sensitivity. Uh, and as far as holding bottom and feeling the bite, the stretch of the mono really doesn't come into play. The stretch of the mono comes into play once you hook that fish. So if you're fishing braid, now all of a sudden you've got to have a top shot or that leader before your leader where you have your braided line, which is your main line, a line to line knot, and about two, or uh, one to two thirds of your line in the water should be monofilament. Then you've got your lead, then you've got your swivel, then you've got your leader. So if you use braided line in your reel, you're complicating things for yourself because then you gotta worry about having a top shot. And uh, it can get a little bit time consuming, especially if you break off or get tangled up and you're having to redo a top shot out in the water. So I would recommend starting with monofilament, 
and really stick into it unless you plan to fish in deep water a lot then that braided line definitely becomes a little bit more helpful. Any other questions? So we have on our website, uh, when you go to hubbardsmarina.com, click fishing trips, scroll down the fishing video links. There's a video on how to hook your bait with the double snell rig to keep it straight. There's a video on how to tie that double snell rig on some of the stuff we talked about today, the stinger rig, there's videos there on how to do all that stuff. So keep that in mind. But to answer his question about J hooks, when you're uh, bottom fishing for uh, reef fish with natural bait in federal waters in the Gulf, you have to use a non-offset, non-stainless circle hook. 95% of the people are like, oh, you can't use J hooks, you've got to use circle hooks, or use an offset circle hooks, which are still illegal. So by definition of the rule, non-offset, non-stainless circle hooks. Tackle shops, if you go over there, they've got a billion J hooks in seven, eight, nine, ten aught size, and they've got a billion different size of offset circle hooks. It's really hard to find non-offset circle hooks. So it's, uh, it's kind of comical to me as far as that law goes. To me personally, you got a good pair of these and you know how to use them, it doesn't matter what kind of hook I encounter. I mean, to me, we have to tell you the rules. And if you rent a rod from me, I'm gonna have non-offset, non-stainless circle hooks for your rental rods. So if you rent a rod, we have to follow the law because this is our occupation, our livelihood. We provide for those rental rods, non-offset, non-stainless circle hooks. But if you come out fishing, it is not my job to go through your tackle box and monitor what tackle you're dropping down. We can tell you the rules, we can have it published, we can talk about it, but ultimately, we don't police your tackle boxes. They do make them, but I would recommend just buying, or buying the hooks, buying the leader, buying the swivels and get and learn how to make them yourself. And they're, they're really, really easy to make. Once you learn the knot, it takes no time at all. So we use uh, Snell hooks or Snell knots on all our hooks, even inshore, even when we're doing circle hooks because it's just such a fast knot. Yeah, I mean, the, the top shot or the leader before the leader as far as how long, Generally, the general rule of thumb is anywhere from one-third to two-thirds of your line in the water because you want that shock absorber, but also it's kind of a, uh, a preventative measure if you get tangled up. But the more experienced the angler, once you master being able to actively fish and keep that line tight enough to feel the lead but not disturb it, you should be able to feel when someone else's line touches yours. So when I'm fishing in 200, 300 foot of water, I can feel when someone else's line starts to touch mine. And I can sense by being aware and looking next to me when I know someone's gonna potentially come over. So when I see that, I'm reeling as quick as I can. And with these high speed gear ratio reels, my two speeds reel is in high, high gear. I mean, I'm up out of the water in 10, 15 seconds and I'm not gonna get tangled up. So I use a lot shorter top shot for that reason because the only reason I have a top shot is to make sure I have a shock absorber there. And even when you do get like someone hooks a big amberjack and it starts zooming up the side of the boat or a big shark, you're gonna get tangled. Even I get tangled, but you are experienced enough, you start to feel that. I start cranking really fast until I feel pressure because you don't wanna keep cranking and, and get your rod bent and try to get out of there because you're going to break off that guy's fish or that girl's fish. I just reel until I feel tension and then I stop and keep my thumb on the spool with the reel and free spool until they land that fish and I get my line out. But if you're able to crank up really fast as soon as you feel that, nine out of ten times it's either tangled with your swivel or your hook and you never lose the top shot even if it's shorter. The only time I lose top shot is if I uh, mess up and, and lose to a gag grouper and it gets me in the rock a little bit, or you hook an amberjack and it tangles or uh, chafes up your top shot, then you have to trim a little off. 
So I keep my top shot shorter because of that confidence level and being able to feel if someone's gonna get me tangled up. But average John Q public who's just starting out with braid, go with two thirds of your line in the water because it is a pain when you get tangled up with braid. The only thing we can do is come over and cut the braid. And then all of a sudden, now you've got to retie a top shot, retie a leader, retie everything. You've lost all your tackle and potentially you've lost 100, 200 feet of that expensive braided line. So a longer top shot for less experienced anglers, shorter top shot for more experienced anglers. But generally, you want at least a third of your line in the water. So if I'm fishing 100 foot, I'd have like a 20 to 30 foot uh, monofilament or fluorocarbon top shot. Anything else? Knocker rigs. Knocker rigs. So a uh, knocker rig, he said, is that strictly inshore, nearshore, is that an offshore rig? So a knocker rig, the idea behind a knocker rig is that you're fishing the water column. A lot of people mess it up. Oh, it's a knocker rig because I don't have a swivel and my weight goes all the way to my hook. No. A knocker rig is not intended to make it to bottom. A knocker rig is intended to fish the water column. So what you're doing is you're using a super light lead to make sure the drag, the hydrodynamic drag of your bait is slow enough that that lead moves away from it. So in the example I showed you earlier, with this six ounce lead, I drop a, a chunk of thread fin down, that lead is gonna be able to pull that thread fin chunk down no problem. But if I was to hook on here uh, uh, a two foot long, big old wide strip of bonita, all of a sudden the drag of that bonita is gonna be stronger than that lead. And my lead is gonna separate from my swivel. And all of a sudden my lead's gonna get further and further from my swivel. And as that lead gets further and further from my swivel, what happens to the descent of the bait? It slows. So as the drag is increased and that lead gets further from it, there's less weight pulling the swivel down, there's more drag of the line. The distance between the lead and your bait creates drag. There's more mono in the water creating drag and there's more weight. So all of a sudden the bait starts descending slower and slower and slower. So take that swivel out and bring that lead to the hook. That's a knocker rig. And if I was dropping down a three foot long piece of bait, this would be a light lead and I would be fishing the water column. But generally when you're knocker rigging, like he asked about, you're using a spinning rod or a super light uh, conventional rod and you're using a setup like this. Now this is set up for our hogfish. So I've got a lot of extra beads on there, which normally for knocker rigging offshore, I wouldn't have those beads on there. But I would put a whole thread fin, don't even cut the tail, I'd put a whole thread fin on here and I'd have maybe a, a, a half ounce to three quarter ounce to one ounce egg sinker and I'd lose the beads. This would be a knocker rig. And as that thread fin goes down, that lead gets further and further from the thread fin because of the drag. And as it gets far away from the thread fin, all of a sudden the thread fin is freely floating the bottom. Very difficult to feel the bite. Uh, but after practice and after doing it for a while, you can get dialed in. And that's how you're gonna catch some of the biggest mangrove snapper, the biggest red snapper. That's how we see those black fin tuna come up occasionally. And it really gives you a good shot to fish the water column. And a lot of the biggest, most quality fish are either at the top or bottom of the water column. So when you're knocker rigging, you really get a good chance at some good quality fish. Plus, a lot of times when the bite's slow, when the bite's slow down on the bottom, it's because those fish have come up off the bottom. They're all chummed up. So knocker rigging, especially like if we get on a spot on a 39 hour trip, everybody's hooked up, you're having a great time, the bite slows down. If you, if you were in the position in the right spot of the boat where the, the current's going out away from you and you're able to drop down a knocker rig, you're gonna get crushed by some big fish up in the water column. So knocker rigging 100% works offshore. Can you do it all the time? No. On a party boat, you can almost hardly get away with it unless you're in a specific spot. I always talk about how the front of the boat's my favorite place to fish and I never would fish the back. 
the one time that I would want to try to fish the back is in that situation. After an hour long stop and we're crushed the mangroves and they all of a sudden stopped and the current was running with the wind. So all the lines were going off the back of the boat. That's one of those times where the back of the boat might be a better spot. Cause then you can pull down that knocker rig and feed it out the back of the boat. And all of a sudden you have a shot at a nice big mangrove. Like Will, our first mate on the 39 hour trip, like the one that came in this morning, they had some rough weather. There was only, I think 27 people that went out there cause it wasn't red snapper season. Uh, it was a nice light load and uh, it was a little rough. So through the nighttime period, not everybody was fishing because some, some people felt a little queasy, you know? And uh, he was able to fish in the back of the boat, knocker rigging, and he told me how many big mangroves he pulled up because occasionally when the bite slowed down and every, no one needed help, he was out there feeding out a, a knocker rig with super light lead, catching some really big mangroves off the back of the boat. So knocker rigging does work, uh, but it's a very, that's like, we're in, we're in 101, 102 level class. That's like 110, that's not, maybe 2010, 210, you know? That's expert level experienced angling. It's very tricky, uh, but you definitely can get some really big fish. Like, oh, excuse me. Like you could be fishing 200 foot of water and you're only using a half ounce egg sinker. A very small lead. Basically, the lighter the lead, the slower the descent, the more natural the bait's gonna appear in the water column. Because you're not fishing the bottom, you're fishing in the water column, meaning you're fishing that space up off the bottom. So you really want a light lead, but if you go too light, then you can't really feel the bite. So it really comes down to experience level. But then if you go too heavy, you're not knocker rigging. It's only in the water column for a second. You want it to be up in the water column for as long as possible, with you being able to feel the bite. Feel the bite. It's tricky. You're using that knocker rig for the hogs though, right? We use a knocker rig for the hogs, but think about it, you're not really knocker rigging. Right. People say you're knocker rigging. Yeah, yeah, you and I, I even called this, we're, so I even called this a knocker rig, but I'm fishing 40 foot of water with a shrimp. This isn't in the water column, but for 20 seconds. It goes right to bottom. So you're not really knocker rigging. I'm fishing the bottom with a knocker rig. So yes and no, you're, you're knocker rig fishing the bottom. <laughs> Any other questions? We are just about out of time. What? Triple tail? Uh, I mean, the biggest thing with triple tail is just being watchful and watching the, the different floating debris. Yeah, they're typically, you're gonna see them up underneath buoys or floating debris, uh, offshore palm fronds. Um, you can catch them in Tampa Bay in a couple foot of water and you can catch them in a thousand foot of water offshore. Uh, one of the coolest triple tail experiences I had was we were on a, I think it was a 73 hour back when we used to do those. And we came across a big shipping uh, buoy. This thing was like as big as a truck and it was floating out there and it was black and we came up on it and underneath it was what looked like a big bait school. It was just black and as we came up, they spooked and it was nothing but triple tail. There must have been a thousand triple tail on this thing, but they were all super small. Yep. Yeah, you never know, you never know. But a triple tail, a, a live shrimp on a free line, live shrimp is really good. Uh, and just overcasting it and then retrieving back to it. Uh, and even if it starts to fall, you just kind of let it fall and that triple tail will kind of go attack it. And sometimes you have to throw it at them a couple times. As long as you don't spook them, you'll have as many shots as you want. Sometimes they won't eat, but most of the time they will. The problem is you have to have a really big triple tail in order to keep it now. Uh, yeah, they changed the in minimum size limit. I think it's, it's either 15 or 18 inches. 15. It's, 15 now, yeah, and uh, that's, that's a big triple tail. So you, have, you really need to find a big one to be able to keep it, but they're a lot of fun to target. And you can do that even in the bay, in Tampa Bay, like those range markers on the Skyway, they'll even be triple tail down towards the bottom of it. So you could just free line a live shrimp and let it sink down that piling and you'll have a chance at them too. So you never know. But we are out of time, guys. Uh, I'm gonna hang out after the seminar. If you guys have some more questions, you're more than welcome to come up and chat with me. 
Uh, also keep in mind tonight at 8.30 p.m. we're gonna continue this conversation on our live stream show. We do those every Sunday night at 8.30 p.m. and uh, we give away free trips during that as well. And uh, we go over some of the photos of what we've been catching and we answer your questions live. You can text in your questions to the show. So if you have more questions, stay after, chat with me or text into the show tonight and hopefully you'll join us for those Sunday night live shows. Don't forget to check us out on Facebook, Instagram, uh, YouTube, uh, Twitter, Twitch. We have a bunch of different social media accounts that you can follow and connect with us. And then also on our website, I mentioned how we have those uh, fishing video links. We have the fishing tips and tricks page, which is a bunch of shorter videos and kind of more topical stuff. But we have all our Bass Pro Shop seminars that we film are listed there too. So we've got like 40 or 50 of these seminars up there so you can catch up with old ones. And then every Sunday night live show since we started them in 2016 are on the page too. So literally you could spend two months watching videos on our website uh, of all fishing information like you received today. So check that out. Also don't forget about our weekly fishing report we do uh, that we put out there on our website too. You can get that emailed to you. There's a newsletter sign up right on the bottom of our homepage at hubbardsmarina.com. So, and we do our weekly radio show from 6 a.m. to 8 a.m. Saturday mornings on 970 WFLA. That's streamed live to our Facebook page too. So every weekend we spend three hours live on Facebook talking fishing. So join us, follow our pages, and hopefully we'll see you out in the water soon. We are gonna do our giveaway here. We're gonna give away our five hour half day for two guests and our 10 hour all day for two guests. But our Bass Pro Shops hosts are gonna talk to you guys for a little bit before we give away our free trips. What's up, Estelle? Don't, oh yeah. I forgot, we do have a Lady Anglers Club too. So Estelle is one of the leaders of our later Lady Anglers Club. If you go to hubbardsmarina.com and click info, the Lady Anglers have their own website page now on our website with the link to the fishing club and uh, they do a lot of different trips and it's a free Facebook group you can join and they, they pick a 10 hour trip or a 39 hour trip and they put out the dates so that way other lady anglers can go together because a lot of uh, what we've experienced is a lot of ladies want to go fishing but they might not feel comfortable popping on a public uh, party boat trip with a bunch of dudes so the lady anglers kind of make it easy for you to know that on that trip there's going to be plenty of other ladies on the boat fishing so you can leave your husbands at home and uh, get out in the water and go fishing uh what's up yes friday morning our fox 13 news segment too but that doesn't need promotion that promotes itself <laughs> uh we're gonna do the giveaway but first we're gonna let our friends at bass pro speak well, hand out the 